out. Well, welcome everybody. I hope everyone had a wonderful luncheon. Um, this is our panel, Healthcare Mandates in a Fundamental Human Rights Perspective. Uh, quick question. There must be some techni technical problem. Is there a problem? No. Nothing we need to know about. Good. Okay, so this panel is healthcare mandates in a fundamental human rights perspective. And um, we will be focusing today mainly on COVID vaccine mandates and the debate about whether employers or governments can mandate um, COVID vaccines. And there is a, a European approach, but it differs among EU members. I'll be talking a little bit about the American approach as well. Um, Albert, Al, Alberto Mattei, is that right? It's okay. It's, well, it's, it's, it's okay. Alberto Mattei. Alberto Mutei is going to be our discussant. And then we have three outstanding panelists, Ricardo Moraga, Merle Erickson, and Matteo Avagaro. And um, what we are going to do is let each speaker present for 10 minutes. Then we will have five minutes of questions after each talk. And then we are going to have commentary um, by our discussant, and then I'm going to make some comments about the American case. So I want to begin with Ricardo Moraga uh, from Rome, from the University of Rome here in Italy, uh, who will be talking about mandatory vaccination in the employment relationship, focusing particularly on the Italian case. Many thanks for the introduction. And first of all, I would like to say thanks to the organizers and the scientific committee for have selected my paper. Uh, in this paper, I will try to show how Italy has faced the question related to the relationship between covenant in vaccination and employment relationship. Uh, the legal doctrine debate on this matter started when the vaccination became available. And uh, the, the most important question uh, that arose uh, are the following. Can the covenant in vaccination obligation may be introduced only by the law or also by the employer? And uh, uh, what measures can be adopted by the employer in case of refusal of vaccination by an employee? Well, with reference uh, to the, the uh, we should subdivide this debate into two most important periods. The first period in which there wasn't a specific uh, law providing for the covenant in vaccination obligation, and uh, a second period in which the legislator introduced a specific covenant in vaccination obligation, but as we will see, only for uh, certain categories of employees. Well, in the first period, so without the presence of a specific covenant in vaccination obligation, the most important provisions taken into consideration by uh, labor law community was, first of all, the Article 32 of the Italian Constitution, according to which the health is a fundamental right of the citizen, but nobody can, can be obliged to undergo a health treatment as the vaccination uh, if this uh, mandatory treatment is not, is not provided for by the law. Uh, the fourth provision important to the discussion is the uh, Article uh, 2087 of the Italian Civil Code, according to which employer has the obligation to adopt all the measures necessary to protect the health and safety of the employees, according to the particularity of the work, experience and technique. And then the provisions of the Consolidated Act concerning health and safety at work, particular the provisions related to the health surveillance carried out within the workplace by the company doctor, and uh, the provision according to which uh, employers should provide effective vaccine for those workers that are exposed to biological agent. Well, the question is if uh, from these provisions that we have mentioned, it's possible to found the possibility of the employer to introduce an obligation to undergo the vaccination within the workplace in order to access the workplace. 
With reference to this question, the answer of the legal doctrine were opposite. On one hand, uh, the answer is that uh, only the law can introduce a obligation to undergo the vaccination. And uh, this possibility is not offered to the employer because these provisions are general provision. And Article 32 of the Italian constitutions uh, requires a specific law introducing a specific COVID-19 vaccination obligation. On the other hand, another part of the doctrine argued that in any case, due to the Article 2087 of the Italian Constitution, of the Italian Civil Code, and so the obligation of the employer to adopt all the measures uh, necessary to protect the health and safety of the employees. Uh, among these measures, the employer may also introduce the COVID-19 vaccination obligation, and the, employer, the employee may refuse this obligation only if he has a, a valid reason. If there is not this reason, uh, it can be suspended from work or dismissed. We have to point out uh, a specific rule introduced by the law, and in particular Article 29 bis of Law Decree 23 of 2020, according to which, with reference to the fight against the pandemic, the Article 2087 of the Italian Civil Code uh, does not allow the employer to introduce whatever measure he considers appropriate but this article should be fulfilled by the employer by introducing the specific measure introduced by the protocol uh, signed by the government and the social bodies on April 2021. So, with reference to the COVID-19 risk, uh, this article of the Italian Civil Code that is a general, generally considered an open clause should be considered a close clause. Uh, namely, a, a, an obligation to be fulfilled with a specific uh, obligation and measure indicated by the protocol. So this is a, a very strong argument to affirm, to say that the employer may not introduce the COVID-19 vaccination obligation. And what about the case law? Uh, I have highlighted two important uh, decisions of labor courts in particular, uh, first, this uh, decision of Labor Court of Belluno of March 2021, according to which the decision of the employer to place on uh, forced holidays unvaccinated health care sector employees uh, is lawful because in this case, the company doctor consider these employees unsuitable to perform the working activity due to uh, the refusal of the vaccination. Another decision of the Court of Milan of September 2021 uh, considered that in general, theoretically, the, the employer may suspend from work and from pay the employee that refused the vaccination in the healthcare sector, but only if it is uh, able to demonstrate the impossibility to uh, allocate this uh, employee to other duties, even lower, uh, duties for which there is not the necessity to protect the employee from the COVID-19 uh, risk. Well, uh, as we have already said, uh, we have two periods. The second period uh, is the period in which uh, the legislator introduced a specific COVID-19 vaccination obligation with Law Decree 44-2021. That uh, does not apply to all the employees, but apply only to specific categories of employees. Uh, namely, in the first uh, version of uh, the, the law, only for healthcare sector, and subsequently, uh, further categories of workers were added, and in particular, school personnel, military personnel. Uh, this uh, law provides a specific pro procedure in order to verify if the employee uh, has made the vaccination. In case of refusal to be vaccinated, the employee may be suspended from work and from pay uh, until the vaccination obligation is fulfilled. In any case, also in this uh, law, uh, there is uh, the provision that the employer should verify the possibility to relocate the employee to other duties, even lower, uh, in which there is not the risk for COVID-19. 
With reference to the specific legal obligation introduced by the law, the most important thing to verify is, is if this law is compliant with the Italian Constitution, and in particular with Article 32 of the Italian Constitution. And uh, in order to make this, uh, this assessment, it's necessary to uh, highlight what are the criteria elaborated by the Constitutional Court related to uh, laws uh, introducing, COVID, uh, introducing vaccination obligation in general. These criteria are three. First of all, the vaccine should be aimed not only to improve the health of the single person, but of all the community. Second, the vaccine should not affect the state of health of the person and uh, at the maximum can create some effects that may be considered tolerable. Three, in the event of further damage to the health of the person, the state should provide for a fair indemnity in favor of the person. Well, well in light of these three criteria, the first decisions of case law consider the vaccination obligation against COVID-19 lawful, but uh, we are seeing that uh, with the um, development of the um, scientific knowledge of the vaccine, the, this approach of the case law is changing. And uh, we, we should highlight that there are some recent case law that consider this obligation not compliant with the Constitution, for example, because uh, the rate, the percentage of people with uh, serious consequences in case of vaccination is improved, uh, or due to the fact that, uh, according to this case law, it's not possible to say that the vaccination obligation for healthcare sector is justified by the need to protect patients, because the data shows that uh, the, the vaccination is not a way to slow down the circulation of the virus, is not a way to um, avoid the infection, but is only a way to make the effects of the disease uh, less serious. And so this argument cannot be used more. In any case, some conclusions. We don't know what the Constitutional Court will say uh, in reference to these aspects, but in any case, the legislator has already pursued all the goals, all the objectives that he wants to pursue because the, the, the percentage of vaccination population has increased uh, and uh, the data of the virus now are better than in the past. Uh, we can also say that uh, the approach of the legislator has been very balanced. Uh, there was a very important prudence to introduce the, ob the obligation to undergo the vaccination and to uh, introduce this obligation only to specific categories of employees for which there is a particular risk to, uh, to, to, to develop a disease in case of COVID-19 infection. So this approach can be appreciated, I think. And we have also learned that in the absence of a specific law introducing a COVID-19 vaccination obligation, is not the employer that can introduce this vaccination unless is the, uh, in light of the health surveillance, is the company doctor that say this worker may not perform the duties if he is not vaccinated because there is a specific risk inside uh, these duties. Um, and so uh, the approach it was very balanced and I think very appreciated. And I think that the debate on this point uh, also is if it refers to the COVID-19, it's very useful also as a general debate uh, in order to to face uh, further case in which uh, there is the necessity to verify the possibility to introduce an obligation to undergo the vaccine. Thanks. Thank you. Now we have about five minutes for questions for Ricardo about the Italian case. Um, any questions from anyone? Don't be shy. I always say that, don't be shy. Francesca Marinelli, yes. Thank you, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very clear. I know that debate uh, was uh, absolutely um, consistent uh, during these 
to dramatic years. So um, what I would like to ask you is uh, if I well understood what you are concluding is that probably from this um, uh, nightmare there is something good uh, uh, coming along, no? Uh, the fact that uh, uh, perhaps we have found out uh, something that could be uh, a principle to use uh, in uh, other uh, scenarios coming in the future. And we, of yes. course, know that this could happen. <laughs> so is that what you are saying? Um, Thanks for the question. Yes, I think that this debate uh, has been, in any case, useful also for further and future case. Uh, we hope uh, that we will not have other pandemic in the future, but in any case, it's very important, I think, that the debate concerning the power of the employer to uh, make mandatory some health treatment to the to the employees. And uh, um, they the think that, uh, I think, only the company doctor may uh, introduce some uh, requirements uh, on the field of uh, the health treatments to, um, to make, uh, to per perform the working activity. So I think that this is the, the, the key question, the key aspect that we can use also in the future. So the, the limits to the power of the employ employer to use the health uh, aspects uh, to refuse the performance of the working activity by the employee. Okay, thank you so much. I think given um, the time, we're going to call Merle Eriksson off. Is that okay? Will yes. you switch with Merle? Yes. Thank you so much, Ricardo. That was wonderful. I loved understanding the comparative case. I read it through American eyes. Uh, and things are very different in Italy, but so logical, you know, well-reasoned, rule of law bound, tied to the rule of law and basic principles, fundamental principles. So um, I appreciate your presentation very much. Um, next, we are going to have Merle Erickson. And Merle, how is your PowerPoint looking? It's looking it's good. good. Yes. <laughs> that is wonderful. Um, and she's coming to us from the University of Tartu in Estonia. In Estonia, yes. Yeah. And I, we were in, my husband and I were in Estonia in 2018. And what a lovely country. Just fantastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're going to turn it over to you. And from what I've read so far, Merle's going to be taking sort of a high level look at several principal questions that need to be answered when we talk about regulating uh, COVID and specifically vaccine mandates in really any country and set us up very nice for a comparison between countries, especially in the EU. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues, and my presentation is about Yes, mandatory vaccination in labor relations in European countries, including Estonia, where I'm from. As you know, many European countries have made vaccination obligatory. And mandatory vaccination... Is it not advancing? We need our... Okay. Yeah, we did it? Yeah. Okay. And mandatory vaccination has raised many questions mainly because the disease is new, the virus mutates constantly, and um, vaccines have been little tested. They may not be effective for all strains of the virus. In terms of legality, the fundamental rights of employee and employee, employer conflict when using vaccines. The employer's right to the inviolability of private life, uh, which includes the right to physical integrity. Also, employer has the right to conduct a business. It comes with a right to decide freely on the business details. Therefore, compulsory vaccination must be a very considerate decision, taking into account that vaccination is not the only measure to combat COVID virus at the workplace. And so my research aims to answer the questions in which case can vaccination be mandatory uh, in employment relationship and I study three subtopics, the legal basis for compulsory vaccination positions where mandatory vaccination is justified and the possibilities of employer 
uh, if the employee refuses to be vaccinated. So the first, uh, first topic is uh, the legal basis for compulsory vaccination. Mm, in European countries, the ob obligation to vaccinate may be imposed by national law or uh, by the employer's decisions. Uh, there is no um, uh, obligation for all adults to be vaccinated against COVID in European countries. However, some countries like Italy have established legislation to make vaccination compulsory in areas uh, like health care and social care facilities, police and rescue services, educational institutions and uh, so on. These uh, areas are important for fulfilling the main public tasks or protecting public health so that the employees of a respective occupation can continue to perform their duties. In legal discussions, uh, it um, has been found that the requirement of compulsory vaccination is such an important decision, but, uh, but uh, such a decision can be adopted only by by legislator, not, uh, not by, um, by um, the employer, exactly, uh, for example. Uh, the greater the violation of a fundamental right is, uh, the higher must be the level of power that regulates it. And um, if a state establishes vac the vaccination requirement, it clarifies the parties to the employment relationship in which areas vaccination is obligatory. However, a minus is that national rules are too general and do not consider individual cases. If a vaccination requirement is introduced by areas of activity, the obligation to vaccinate um, may also apply to employees who do not come into contact with other people, other persons, or where human contact can be avoided by implementing other measures uh, that are less intrusive on employees' privacy. Uh, so, in addition to the state, employers also have obligation of option to require vaccination to rule out occupation, health and safety rules. Employers must take the measures necessary for employee safety uh, and health protection, including prevention, pre preventing uh, occupational risks. Uh, they also must implement measures to protect from biological hazards like coronavirus and uh, organize uh, a risk assessment of a working environment. Uh, employers are required to introduce collective protection measures of personal protective equipment, ensuring the possibility of vaccination for employees. And uh, in Estonia, for example, it is common practice for employers to carry out risk assessment and conclude that the only measure to ensure the safety of employees is to vaccinate them. On the one hand, uh, such an approach can be accepted as the employer can accurately assess whether employees' vaccination is necessary for each workplace. On the other hand, the employer may not always be able or willing uh, to evaluate the need for immunization adequately. So in both, case, in both case, cases, regardless of whether the obligation of to vaccinate is imposed by state or by employer, the vaccination requirement must be justified. So the next topic I was studied is uh, positions where mandatory vaccination is justified. And as, as I said before, Many European countries have introduced mandatory vaccination by areas of activity. Uh, as I mentioned, for example, the healthcare and social care sector, the educational institutions, cultural institutions, armed forces, police, and so on. Uh, the question arises as to whether introducing a general vaccination obligation by sector is justified. Mm, there are jobs in, in each field of activity. There is uh, where it's possible to prevent an employee from becoming infected by less intrusive measures on their privacy. So there may be employees in each sector who do, do not need compulsory vaccination. 
uh, if an employee is contact with other people is infrequent and superficial, it's questionable whether such an employee should vaccinate himself. So I, we come back to the test of justifying the violation of fundamental rights. The requirement for vaccination must be purposeful, appropriate and proportionate. In our countries, the obligation to vaccinate has been established as a more general principle. Uh, vaccination is required of employees who have physical close contact with other people in their workplace. Uh, taking into account how coronavirus uh, spreads, mandatory vaccination is justified in positions where the employees in constant unavoidable close contact with other persons. And uh, I think that in practice, the best solution could be a combined option. So that the state determines the areas of activity where vaccination could be required and um, employer makes the final decision on which employees have to, to vaccinate themselves. And the last uh, topic I um, studied um, what to do if a, uh, an employee who refuses to be vaccinated to amend employment contract or to, to terminate, uh, terminate it. Uh, according to general rule of labor law, an employment contract can usually be amended by an agreement between an employee and employer. But uh, in uh, some European countries, in the event of refusal to vaccinate, the employer is allowed to amend the employment contract unilaterally. Um, according to the practice of different countries, uh, if an employee does not fulfill the obligation to vaccinate, uh, he or she will not be provided with, uh, with work. Uh, this is considered as a suspension of employment co contract without pay or, or unpaid leave. Uh, in some cases, the employee must be offered another job before leaving work. And uh, I think that uh, this is the best solution as it allows the employee to, to continue working and earn income in, a, in another position where vaccination is not uh, required. However, in some other countries, um, the employer has a right to terminate employment contract immediately after uh, an employee refused to, to vaccinate uh, himself. And in Estonia, uh, if the employee disputes, disputes terminate, termination of employment contract, he or she must prove that the requirement for vaccination was not purposeful, appropriate and proportionate. Uh, it is important to note that uh, opinions on that issue have changed in Estonian case law. We highlight the end of the last year and at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, our court decided that uh, the requirement of vaccination is uh, justified. Uh, but uh, since March this year, the courts have also made other decisions. Uh, courts has warned but since March 2020, when coronavirus was declared as pandemic, the information about the virus spread, the strains, and the severity of symptoms have changed. Uh, knowledge who must be vaccinated with fixed vaccine also has changed. <laughs> Thus, up, uh, up, upon the termination of employment contract, uh, employer could not have sufficient knowledge that the vaccination was the only and proportionate uh, measure. And I agree with, this, uh, with our courts because uh, COVID-19 is a new disease and uh, virus is mutating constantly. Um, rapidly developed vaccines may always not be an effective way to, to combat uh, coronavirus. So I'm ending. Uh, finish there. Uh, thank you very much. for. Thank you very day. much. So a, a slightly different perspective on the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, right? I mean, it's sort of interesting to think about 
well, if we are going to approve vaccine mandates, say for the healthcare sector, but the virus is faster than the scientists yeah. in developing the vaccine, then we're mandating that people be injected perhaps against their will and it might not protect them but it might protect them. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes really, really difficult. And so that's what I really appreciated about your presentation and the abstract that I, that I read, that you were really thinking hard about the science. So there are the fundamental rights mm -hmm. and employee dignity, employer rights mm -hmm. on the other hand, and yet there's the science of vaccination. Yeah. Uh, and where we are headed with it. It's a very complicated issue. Are yeah. we going to mandate that people every three months yeah, get a yeah, shot? Yeah, Is that yeah. where we're headed in order to keep their jobs and avoid leave or termination? Okay, any questions for uh, Merle now? We have time for a question about the approach and how we handle the difficulty of the vaccine, perhaps not having the lasting effect that we would hope. It's not like you get two shots and you're set for life. Anybody thinking about how law might balance that? And speakers can also ask questions if they want. Questions? Anybody? Okay, um, so let me see. I think I had one question for Merle. Um, so you had said that a vaccine mandate should be a last resort. Yeah. Because there are other ways in which to protect the workforce yeah. from transmission. All right, so if you were counseling uh, a legislature, right? If you're giving advice to elected representatives, how would they be sure that in fact their mandate was the last resort? It's easy to say it as a recommendation and harder to implement it in practice. Um, I, in this point, I was thinking about this risk assessment, what employers must, um, must do. Uh, and uh, according to risk assessment, employer can take uh, different measures like uh, uh, like int uh, introducing some other protective measures to, to organize work differently and and so on that's why I was uh, I was uh, keeping in mind when I wrote <laughs> that so this is the last measure vaccination is the last measure right and so then the question is if there's a general permission or mandate from the government to allow employers to mandate vaccination, how could employers protect themselves from litigation, from being sued over a vaccine mandate? Uh, I guess just present the risk assessment yeah, to the yeah, court, yeah, yeah. right? But, but, yeah, yeah, but uh, in, for example, in Estonian courts, uh, they um, evaluate this risk assessment are we uh, suitable or, or, or not? So, they could challenge the yeah, risk assessment yeah, in the yeah. way it has been compiled. Yeah. So it's very risky business yeah, for, risky business for, for employers, employers yeah. right? Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And of course, as a lawyer who used to give advice to employers, mm -hmm. it's, it's not always comfortable to say you run a big risk of trying to do what you would like to do, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. I think now we uh, are ready for Matteo uh, to take the speaker's seat. Um, and thank you again, Merle. So, th is it working? Yeah. So, thank you very much to our chair, to our discussant, and I would like to thank you also the organizers of the Marco Biaggi conference for the opportunity to be here all together in presence. And uh, yeah, that is a good point, and also the result of vaccination. So we are talking about uh, uh, a thing that helped us also to be here in this conference and have this beautiful experience. It is the Marco Biaggi conference. So. I see from the title, uh, uh, my paper and so my presentation was about the EU digital COVID certificate and uh, in particular considering if it was a nudge 
for vaccination and about it is implica um, implications uh, and legacy in the field of employee relationship. Uh, why a nudge for vaccination? Because, uh, no, very good. Okay, perfect. So, because as uh, maybe people who traveled uh, in Europe uh, in the last year uh, already know, but I explain also for everybody that is here, the EU Digital COVID Certificate was uh, an administrative act at the end, so a paper or digital based uh, document that attested that the holder got uh, oh, or a full vaccination or a negative COVID test uh, very recently, so in the last 24 hours, 48 hours, it depended from each country, or that was recovered from COVID-19. And it was introduced by EU regulation 2021-953 in uh, mid, uh, in June of uh, 2021, as an instrument to allow people to move uh, um, throughout the boundaries in uh, EU, so between different countries, uh, with the possibility to avoid restriction to freedom of movement that were, have been introduced to cope with the pandemic and that remained valid for other people, so for people not having the certificate. So what was the purpose of this certificate? The purpose was uh, not to introduce further limitation for people not having the certificate, but allowing people that had this certificate to enjoy a, a wider freedom than the others. In this way, since at the end you see the three options, so getting recovered for COVID is not a great option to get the certificate because it means that you have to be uh, infected by COVID before, so I think anybody hopes so. Uh, having the negative COVID test is quite difficult because, first of all, you have to pay to do the test. And on the second hand, uh, in general, for example, if you go to a conference and you stay away for five days, maybe you have to do a test before leaving your country and another test before coming back to your country. So it's quite unpleasant, uncomfortable and complicated. Getting the vaccine means that you have one shot and then for four, five, six months, you have a valid certificate that uh, allow you to move uh, through different countries in you without any other problem or limitation. So you see that is clearly a gentle push to go and get vaccinated. And for this reason, I ask to myself, it is, if it is uh, the first, for the first time, a massive application in Europe of the nudge theory, that is that behavioral theory that goes into the direction to introduce some gentle push, so without materials or economic incentives, in order to drive people to do specific choices in line with uh, uh, public uh, objectives in general. A clear example is to put uh, healthy food at level of your eyes in the supermarket in the way that you buy that one and you don't buy junk food that is um, higher or lower generally. So I asked myself if the EU G digital COVID certificate is a form, an application of this theory, this uh, nudge theory. The reply at the end is not, because here there are monetary and material incentives to get the certificate against not getting it, because in this way you can move throughout the countries without particular problems. So, And this is also an incentive to get vaccinated, because as I said before, you have to pay for the test, and the test creates you more problems to move through the countries, and they are not uh, so simple problems to solve because you risk to get uh, to have to do the quarantine, to remain in other countries. So in this case, it's not an, a, a practical application of the nudge theory. But in any way, it is a way to encourage people to get vaccinated, providing them an advantage on the other people without restricting freedoms of people that don't have the certificate more than uh, the condition in which they were already restricted before. Another story is uh, the implementation of the EU COVID certificate in national countries. So the EU COVID certificate, uh, digital COVID certificate worked, as I uh, already explained, and worked for the whole Europe. Each country implemented a national level that certificate extending it to other purposes. Uh, I examined the case of Italy and France, uh, in general, they uh, based on the national version of the EU digital COVID certificate, the policy to encourage people to get vaccinated. They introduced the certificate as a requirement 
to customers and users to access some public places from uh, public offices to school to leisure places, but I haven't considered this aspect in the, my study. I have considered in my study the introduction of the national version of the COVID certificate in order to access to workplaces, so directly affecting workers. And we say that here the situation is quite different because from uh, August 2021 in France and October 2021 in Italy, uh, this certificate has been implemented, as I said, as a prerequisite to access workplaces. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, in general, it meant that people without this certificate were substantially prevented to work because for most of all of jobs, if you cannot access the workplace, at the same, you cannot work. But uh, these two different kinds of certificate that in France was called Pass Sanitaire, in Italy, because we love speak English, we call it Green Pass, or better, Certificazione Verde in Italian, but then was translated by newspapers, by experts, but also by politicians as Green Pass. So everybody yes. said the Green Pass. And uh, so these two certificates, in any case, in France and in Italy, have some differences. So. The similar aspect is this one, that they introduced a prerequisite to work, or better, as I will explain below, as uh, to access workplaces. So they introduced it, it was not the same uh, rationale that was applied to the EU Digital COVID Certificate, that has not introduced limitation, but make, made easy to move throughout uh, the countries, so increasing your freedom. In this case, the certificate became a condition to do an important thing that before you were allowed to do without having a certificate. So the possibility to work, and the possibility to work for some people is the possibility to earn so their, their main source of income. And so it is not a thing that is not important for people. But in any case, these two certificates work with, different, with some differences. First of all, the field of application. Because in France, the certificate was extended to workplace, but just to a specific list of workplaces that in general included the leisure places, catering services, health facilities, basically, and not many more. There were also train, airplanes, yeah, but not many more. And within this workplace, so for people working in these places, just for people that were in contact with the, the public that were accessing these places. This means that, for example, in a restaurant, people serving at the tables were requested to have a certificate. People working in the back office, so for example, cookers, were not requested to have it. And uh, the sanction for people requested to have the certificate and that, that were without it was a suspension from their activity. And they, so the um, possibility to work was suspended. They were not fired, not dismissed but they were suspended and they lost the remuneration for the period in which they were suspended. Yeah. And uh, anyway, for the employer, remained the possibility to reassign these workers to tasks that were not requesting the certificate, for example, moving someone in the back office. And also for these workers, there was the possibility to look for another job. In the meantime, they were suspended, obviously a job not requesting the certificate. This assumed that these people were not wanting to get vaccinated, to get the negative COVID test, or they were not recovered from COVID, obviously, because the condition to obtain this national certificate was exactly the same of the EU digital COVID certificate. In Italy, the situation was quite different, simpler for one side, but also with the relevant differences. So in Italy from October 2021, the Green Pass became mandatory substantially to access any kind of workplace, any public and private uh, uh, place in which employees were working, but became mandatory, for example, also for self-employed. And also for people, for, this is quite important, that were not teleworking before, um, before the certificate was introduced. These people were prevented to switch to telework, so to say, I don't want to have the certificate, so I start teleworking and I don't have to do that. No, it was forbidden also that by the government. So just people full-time teleworking before the introduction of a certificate and people full-time teleworking every day of the year in Italy is a quite rare thing. 
were allowed to continue working not having the certificate. So the scope of application was very wider than the French one, and also the sanction, because employees that was uh, not having the certificate was declared as unjustified absent, so the consequence was similar to France, because they were suspended from work, but there was not the possibility to reassign them to their task, and as well, since the scope of application of the certificate was so wide, it was also difficult for these people to find another job that was possible to do without the certificate for the period in which they were suspended from the main job. So, different scope of application and different consequences. This is what I've just explained because I anticipated what I've put in this slide. So here there are the differences and the important thing that shows and uh, un highlights what I just said was in particular, you see in the table uh, on the line of coverage that the French passe sanitaire covered more or less 2 million of workers. So 1.8 million in Italy, the Green Pass was applied to more than 20 million of workers. This gives you the idea of the difference of the impact that these two different instruments had on the life of a lot of people. So having, having seen this result, I asked to myself two main questions. The first one was, maybe this different is due to the different uh, role that social dialogue had in the implementation of these two different instruments in France and in Italy. And the second question is, what is the relationship with this, between these measures and uh, the legal framework of occupational health and safety that in France and Italy is quite similar because it was coordinated by European directives. So the reply for the first question is quite straightforward because while social dialogue was quite an important thing in order to manage the pandemic in general, you see that both in France and in Italy, social dialogue was at the basis of important trilateral agreements executed between employers and workers' organizations and the government during the pandemic, mainly about telework, occupational health and safety, not concerning vaccination, so before the introduction of masks in workplace, control of temperature, et cetera, et cetera. There was not social dialogue in both countries about the introduction of these two kind of passes. So the French pass sanitaire and the Italian green pass. That then they had some variations because in France was uh, introduced afterwards another pass that was requesting just vaccination and not the negative COVID test. In Italy, another pass just for people with more than 50 years. But anyway, the two important version was this one, the one that I just explained. So we see no social dialogue. And uh, I tried uh, to find two replies to this one. The first one is uh, that maybe this was due by the fact that both the countries had to introduce the framework for this pass to access workplaces in a very fast pace. So vaccines become available in June massively, in June 2021, before they were available so just for some professional, health professional, uh, fragile people, but not for everybody. In June 2021, they started the campaign and they had to have everything ready for September, so the full resume of schools and work. So they said, OK, we have not time for social dialogue. We go straight forward introducing the policy. Another point was that government consciously treated this issue like a public health issue. For this in general, there is not social dialogue and not mainly as an occupational health and safety issue for which in general social dialogue is utilized in both the countries. So these are two possible explanations. The other side of my study is about uh, the nature of these two instruments. So I asked to myself, are these the Green Pass and the Pass Sanitaire in France a particular form of workplace safety measure or not? I made a comparison with two main concepts. One is to prerequisite to carry out a job. That means not an occupational health and safety instrument, but the, those prerequisites that are, impo that are imposed by law for more general public policy goals. The classic example, for, for, for example, is the need to have a, a particular qualification to carry out a profession. Lawyers are requested to have passed aesthetics and to exercise their activity in Italy. And this is a prerequisite to carry out a job, because if not, you cannot lawfully carry out that profession. The other parameter for comparison was occupational, uh, uh, well, better, workplace, safety measures. So I asked to myself if uh, Green Pass and Pass Sanitaire were those measures that in general the employers adopt 
at company level to uh, avoid any, uh, any risk for people working there on the basis of a risk assessment uh, carried out in concreto in that establishment. My reply is that both the passes are a half away solution between these two parameters. First of all, they are not a prerequisite to carry out a job because they are not linked to possibility to do a specific job. I said, as I said before, theoretically in Italy and more practically in France, it was possible to continue working for people not having this certificate while they switched to telework, for example. So it was not a requirement to carry out a specific job. It was a requirement to access workplaces that anyway prevented some people to concretely work at the end. And it was not a workplace safety measure, basically because it was not adopted by the employer on the basis of a risk assessment, but was imposed by the legislator. And also because one of the three conditions to get the pass, so to have a negative COVID test, was not an work, a workplace safety measure in itself, because it, it doesn't increase the direct protection for a worker. If you have a negative COVID test, you just show that you are not infected while the vaccine increases your protection because it reduces the possibility to get the infection and also reduces the possibility of uh, the worst uh, uh, negative effects of the infection. So it is a half away uh, solution at the end, but a solution both in France and in Italy in which there is an occupational health and safety uh, dimension. Basically in the France pass sanitaire, the occupational health and safety dimension is the one to protect people from a specific risk, as I said before, people working in direct contact with the public, so more at risk to get infected. And so the goal of the pass sanitaire so was to push these people to get vaccinated to increase the protection of these specific people. In Italy, when it covered more than 21 million of workers, the scope of the measure was considerably higher because it considered the COVID-19 as a generic risk, so an omnipresent risk in every kind of workplace at the same way, in the same level of risk. If it was a person working in a crowded restaurant, at the same as people were working in an office in which they were alone or for self-employed, having their office alone without employees or other people and spending most of the time alone. So the scope is very wide and the, I'm going to the conclusion. One of the consideration that I developed on this basis, so on the basis of the Italian Green Pass, is what that uh, below this uh, introduction of this measure, there was an underlying strategy. An underlying strategy that substantially consisted in uh, create, introducing the Green Pass as a condition to carry out any job as an instrument to make people voluntarily comply with a public policy goal that at the end was to get vaccinated without introducing an obligation to get vaccinated. And abstracting from the pandemic context, this uh, uh, disclosure disclose a strategy that could consist in conditioning the possibility to carry out any job to the fact that people are complying to obviously a different public policy goal, although it is not mandatory to do that. And I asked to myself, what could be the legacy of this kind of strategy in, uh, for employees, substantially? And the legacy are two-sided, I would say. The first one concerns the statutory level. So this regulatory policy could be applied by the legislator in other places or for other purposes. It is quite difficult, at least in Italy. I focus the analysis in Italy here because the Green Pass was adopted just in Italy. It is quite difficult for two reasons. First of all, because to adopt already the Green Pass, there was the need in Italy to justify the introduction of this certificate that was, that was really limiting freedom and rights of people on the basis of balancing of constitutional rights. So in this case, because we were facing a an unprevented, unexpected, incredible, serious pandemic with lethal effects for a lot of, pe of people was justified from the constitutional point of view to limit other rights like the right to work. In a condition less serious, it would not be justified. And also because from a statutory, statutory point of view, adapt this strategy to other emergencies, for example, climate change is quite difficult. So what is the condition that you could impose to workers to comply in order to reach a public policy goal related to 
climate change. It's quite difficult to envisage it. It is more clear about health, uh, occupational health and safety or health of people, so preventing the contagion because people infected can go to work and also infect other people. From the employer's point of view, it is the most interesting consequence, I would say, because the idea to introduce the Green Pass, so to condition it, the possibility to work to this behavior of people, raised it among some employers. I provided the point of view of the vice president of the OTB Foundation, that in Italy, the name is uh, not really meaningful, but is uh, an holding that uh, includes, for example, diesel and other important fashion firms. So, it is a multinational holding, uh, very important. The president suggested that in the next future, each company could have in the East DNA the mission to develop uh, in the green and social domains. So context that uh, could be also positive. A commitment towards sustainability that each employee will undertake to comply by signing the employment agreement. That means the company would like to impose the employee to uh, uniform his private behavior so to some social policy goals or any way ethical goals that the company has. So it is possible, as to myself, to really do this thing in Italy. So to say, okay, you work for me. I'm doing a campaign, a commercial campaign, in which I say that I am a very super green company in which I respect every kind about the green, uh, green things. So not to pollute the environment or do anything against the environment. And so I can uh, include in your employment agreement a clause that says, okay, you work for me. So you have to comply with that. You can share, for example, on your social network, any image that shows that you have a very old car that is very polluting the environment or similar things. Well, a positive obligation is difficult because in general in Italy, the object of the employment agreement must be consistent with the professional profile of the person, cannot go beyond this limit. So you cannot say you are my employee, so I ask you to do whatever I want for myself because I am your owner, obviously. You have to stay consistent with the tasks of this employee. But there are other, uh, other hypotheses. For example, the possibility to include an obligation not to do. So not an obligation for which you have, I don't know, change all the uh, heating system in your company because you have to make it uh, less polluting. This is not possible. But it's possible to introduce a clause that asks you not to assume a public behavior in contrast with the, the uh, interest of your employer or the fact that you are integrated in the employer organization. There are some case law about that. The only limit is that this clause not to do cannot limit constitutional rights of the employee, but there is a margin. And also another hypothesis in which this uh, employer desire could be realized is that uh, trend that was highlighted by a recent uh, newspaper article on the Financial Times in the US, that is this policy of companies to ask people to voluntarily, voluntarily inter brackets, obviously, because if you are a precarious employee and the employer asks you to do something voluntarily, you know, you're not really desiring to do that, maybe. But to, add, uh, to act voluntarily as influencers of the employer, for example, use your social network to say, I got promoted, my employer is fantastic, I, I'm incredibly happy about that. Or saying, oh, look, this campaign that my employer is doing is fantastic, I totally agree with that. That obviously is a limitation of the freedom of an employee because the employee so must uniform what publishes, for example, in social network, I make that example because it is the clearer one, I think, eh, to the desire of the employer. And so this is quite a tricky thing. And the final message of my analysis, so is this. From a general point of view, we saw that the national implementation of the certificates in France and in Italy changed the perspective initially adopted by the EU digital COVID certificate. So not something that encourages you to get vaccinated, giving you more freedom than the others, but a certificate that limits the freedom of everybody and says, okay, if you get the certificate, I let you do what the people were totally free to do before the introduction of the certificate. We saw that there are some similarities and differences between the, the Italian and French certificate. Both are alpha way solutions between a prerequisite to carry out a job and an occupational health and safety measure. So at the end, there are prerequisites to access workplaces, but they are different basically in the scope. So in Italy, it was almost 
every kind of job was prevented to do without the certificate. And this lead us to discuss to the underlying strategy that I've just explained. And the final message is to keep an eye in particular on how the employers will try to transform this strategy into asking them at company level, try to conditionate the personal behavior of the employees, making this behavior compliant with the more general goals that the company, for example, is following for commercial purposes. Greenwashing is the most clear example. So, I think I've finished it, and if you have some questions, I am to be like. Yeah, thank you. You know, Matteo, I just absolutely loved this presentation. I thought it was great that you start out with nudge theory and something which sounds so logical and plausible, and it ends up being transformed into top-down <laughs> regulation at the national level. Uh, you know, hopefully it is not possible to extend that too much further than a COVID emergency. We'll see what happens. Any questions for Matteo now um, on this really fascinating presentation? Francesca. Um, I, if I got your point, uh, thank you. If I got your point, uh, you are saying that the Green Pass uh, has uh, substantially created uh, an obligation without saying it. Um, to be honest, I, I read the, the Gentle Nudge. Uh, it was a wonderful book, uh, very inspiring. Um, at the beginning, I was a little bit scared about uh, this idea, you know, uh, because uh, we are so lazy, the time is always so less. Uh, so someone deciding for us could be, but then, after what you have said, what I'm asking you, um, is not less scaring to give us a gentle nudge. Um, it means that the choice remains to us in the end. Instead of create a real obligation, we can't escape, you know? Is it, so, a, is it a real choice? Basically, uh, before saying if it is better or not, I would say it's very simpler from the political point of view because the one of the issues at the basis of the introduction of mandatory vaccination in Europe was that there were political problems. So some parties that was not very confident about introducing this kind of obligation. Another point, I think that at the end, uh, the utilization of the passes in this way, both as they did in France, that was less invasive of the private sphere of employees, and also as they did in Italy, was justified in this case, because we faced a very scary pandemic that had uh, bad effects. Uh, uh, a lot of people died, so it was not a joke in this case. Uh, I think that in this case it can be justified. So I think uh, at the end was a solution that ensured a high level of compliance and ensured also that a lot of people are vaccinated. I'm quite a bit scared how this uh, regulatory strategy could be used for different purposes. And uh, yeah, in my presentation I said, okay, it's difficult because obviously it's difficult to adjust this policy to other problem or issues that could arise. I, I made the example of climate change because it is the other great emergency that we will face in next time. So it is difficult to conditionate the possibility to work to something related to climate change. But we have to say that also maybe if we had this discussion three years ago, we would say it is impossible that they condition the possibility to work, to do a vaccination to all the people, to more than 20 million people in Italy. So it is better to stay focused on this point and uh, to be careful with utilizing this strategy, in my opinion. It would be, it was a good uh, thing in this case, but it has to remain an exceptional thing that was utilized to face uh, an uh, incredible crisis. And another point that I think goes into the direction of the observation that Francesca made that is really interesting. It also that this kind of policy is tempting 
for the public administration and the legislator in particular for two reasons. First one, it, uh, it, is, it, it ensures a high level of compliance because are the employers that are checking that people are compliant. So you don't have to appoint state agents to verify. They are the employers acting as state agents. And about that, there was uh, not a big debate in Italy, but a big debate in France, in which there were a lot of labor lawyers and labor law experts that were saying, OK, but in this way, we are transforming employers in state agents. White employers in, uh, I don't want to say policemen, but uh, health and safety agents. So, and the other point, it is not, it doesn't only ensure a high level of compliance, but for states, and in particular European states that are every time uh, uh, facing balance issues, it is a uh, tempting because it is incredibly low cost. Imagine if you would had to appoint uh, public agents to check if people were having the having had the vaccination or to check the certificate for all the Italian people. Maybe the state would have had to hire other agents or appoint or do some uh, so, so subcontract to this activity. In this way, were the employer that has been subcontracted to do this activity. So they did the activity and the checking activity on behalf of the state. And the state ensured a high level of compliance, saving also a lot of money. So for this reason, for these two reasons, it is a tempting strategy because it ensures highly level of compliance at low cost. And because it is a, a dangerous strategy that it is allowed, it is justified in this uh, dangerous situation, but it cannot become an exceptional thing that at the end become usual to face any crisis. For these reasons, I think it is uh, important to be careful with this strategy. Not forgetting that my main point is not uh, the risk that the legislator would uh, utilize this strategy in a large way, because I said that it is not simple also for legal reasons. But for the fact that the employers would say, okay, since the state conditioned the possibility to work, the fact to get vaccinated, I want that people stay in line with my ethical or uh, social commitment if they want, if they work for me. And this is more dangerous because in this way, there are some legal margins to do that. And so I think that this can be a legacy that at the end would uh, result uh, in a further restriction of uh, personal freedom of uh, workers in, not into the direction of the uh, so improvement of public health or good uh, goals like that, but at the end to sustain commercial campaigns of the employers. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. <laughs> and now, Alberto, our discussant to weave the threads together. So, thanks, Susan. And I like uh, start. Uh, by thanking the Marco Biaggi Foundation for giving me the opportunity to be a discussant in this parallel session. So within this session on healthcare mandates in a fundamental right perspective, I would like to focus the attention on some aspects resulting from the papers presented by Matteo Vogaro, Merle Eriksen and Riccardo Maraga. I would just like to say a couple of words and some uh, and share some brief reflections uh, as a discussant. Key words emerge uh, such as uh, first uh, changes, especially concerning uh, legislation, but not only. Second, balancing of values or balancing of rights, especially value of public health and right to work. Third, a vertical approach, especially role of the state in the pandemic emergency with respect to individual autonomy. Fourth, the reasonable solutions, especially when they concern the employment relationship. So we have changes, we have balancing of values, we have a vertical approach, we have also reasonable solution. Personally, I think this is the one of the first time that I have acted as a discussant, and certainly is the first time that I'm debating uh, this topic that I have started quite 
recently, but where I can already that the issue have been changing and probably changing in the future. As a matter of fact, I think about it, when I think about it, the team itself does not change, but the conditions, the point of the analysis and the perspective of the team change. For example, when I think the Italian legal system, over the past year, there have been a numerous legislative measures and change of protocols on the collective side. Also, some important case law rulings, as uh, Mel Eriksen and Ricardo Maraga tell us uh, in their papers. As uh, Matteo Vogaro tell us, the EU digital COVID certificate changes. It has evolved from a tool to allow safe cross movement uh, to a pass aim at ensuring that also the workplace are spaces where the COVID-19 virus cannot circulate. Or rather, I think the EU digital COVID certificate can reduce the circulation of the virus. Honestly, sometimes there is a feeling of disorientation with a lot of legislative measures. However, certainly the updates are due to changing epidemiological situation. One of the problems that arises is when emergency management is handled with a lack of clarity and transparency in public communication. A time that happened, but at the end of the state of emergency, has certainly brought the situation for a physiological management of problems. There is, for us, I think, a necessary preliminary question we must ask. What lesson can we draw from the pandemic experience? I realize that this is a general and difficult question to answer, not least because the pandemic is not over, while fortunately, for example, for Italy, the pandemic state of uh, emergency has ended. I'm thinking so in this case for Italy, but also it's true for the European countries. In terms of method, we are faced with an intersection between law and medical science. So in our case, we are in bioethics perspective, affecting the legislation choices. Much, in fact, of the demandatory vaccination is based on the most reasonable way forward recommended by medical science and what are the most reasonable tools to deal with the pandemic, so in a pragmatic approach, I mean. In a, a recent book entitled Protecting Life, a famous political philosopher, Jungen Habermas, reflect on the issue of reconciling freedom and solidarity. Those are the issue among the various point. What is the state objective in protecting health? Can the government impose solidarity on citizen? What is the relationship between the solidarity on the citizen and the private autonomy of the individual? In his book, one key word is solidarity. And in the paper of this session, this concept occurs only on the Ricardo Maraga's paper, also in the last slide. And in particular, what emerges the implication of solidarity that is peculiar to a state of emergency. Habermas' book does not reflect in particular on mandatory vaccination. It recalls the theme, the primacy of public health protection by the states, which make it necessary to reflect on the relationship between politics and law. So the trouble relationship between politics and law. While law is the instrument to secure subjective freedom, politics is the means to realize the overending collective goal. First is the public health. All the three papers deal with the central theme of vaccination. I think it was certainly the most controversial, debated, and discussed topic in the last year. But in the background, the framework of the team involved more generally the protection of health and safety in the workplace. Matteo Vogaro provided us with a reflection of the incentive of, for vaccination as a judge, as a nudge, sorry, for the cast sustain perspective, given the free vaccine versus the test. PCR test or lateral flow test, which instead involve cost, and you underline this aspect. In his paper, he highlights how the social partners 
were left outside alone. And this is clear that the social partners cannot impose an obligation to vaccinate, and you underline this aspect. However, my question to you is, you, you is in the light of collective production of protocols uh, since 2020 in Italy, don't you see the possibility for the industrial relations so on the collective side to take charge of certain aspects to prevent and protect the health and safety in the workplace? This is my question for you, Matteo. Merle Eriksen, in the second paper, raises the question of how only the state can impose vaccination. She provided a comparative reflection on how single European states have imposed mandatory vaccination and emphasized the importance of the case-based approach. A clear fact emerges that is only the law can impose mandatory vaccination or not, and this is different with the US state comparison. However, a central rule is placed on the role of the employer. The employer rules emerges in the obligation to reassign the non-vaccinated employee to other duties. So there is a duty of relocation for the employee, for the employer to the employee. But my question to you is in the Estonian legal system that you examine, it and what role does the company doctor play in the company decision? That's my question for you. In the third paper, Ricardo Maraga recalls one of the many rulings, rulings that have addressed the issue on mandatory vaccination for the Italian case. For example, the ruling of the Italian Council of the State in October 2021 that we discussed here in a seminar in Marco Biaggi Foundation last October. Mandatory vaccination is a more general issue in addition to implying a delicate balancing act between fundamental values self-determination and public health as an interest of the community first and foremost according to a solidaristic perspective. This affects the very relation between science and law and is obvious and even more fundamentally the relationship between knowledge and therefore information and this opposite disinformation or misinformation and democracy. My question to you, Ricardo, is as you pointed out, the case law changes in Italy and in several passages point to the issue of balancing rights. If, for example, we excluded the healthcare sector where the employee work, for example, in a hospital, could an issue arise between balancing the right to public health and the right to work for those who have not been vaccinated but still want to work, which there is a right to remuneration under Article 36 of the Italian Constitution. So this is my question for our speaker, and I don't think there are any conclusions to be drawn for the discussion, so, as, so much as an overall appreciation for the thoughts provided on a such controversial topic. So thanks for the attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alberto. Before I turn to Ricardo and Merle Matteo, um, I, I wanted to make a, a plea for framing this issue along the ideas of national culture. Um, as I've looked at the problems in the United States, we have one million people who have died of COVID-19, one million. Part of the reason that they died was a certain kind of individualistic religious obstinacy. They're, people are obstinate uh, in the United States. They do not like to be told what to do. And that plays out in our case law, and it plays out in our constitutional interpretation, and it plays out when it comes to public health mandates. I wanted to say that if we think about regulatory solutions in line with national culture, we will be doing what Marco Biagi asked us to do. We will be pragmatic. Uh, as it's turning out in the United States, it is becoming very difficult for the government to impose any kind of vaccine mandate, even in the healthcare sector. Successful challenges are being launched against government action. And even where it appears government action might legally be permissible, 
politically, it is impossible, absolutely impossible. Even in a state like my home state of California, the state government does not want to impose a vaccine mandate. On the other hand, we're a place with very thin worker protection and lots of rights for employers. A lot of public health-minded employers are imposing vaccine mandates. It has greatly increased the uptake of vaccination. It has held down, at least that's what the public health officials tell us, held down the level of COVID transmission. So we have private actors acting as public officials a bit more acceptable in the US. In the US, because we're independent uh, and individualistic, it turns out we're also incredibly religious. And so a lot of the objections to vaccine mandates implemented by anybody, government or private employer, are being stated in terms of religious belief that the body is God's temple, to force someone to take a vaccination is to pollute that temple. And so employers have to then navigate religious difficulties. And none of our speakers talked about that in Europe, which I think is interesting because we don't have a state religion in the United States, and yet that's where people go when they object to COVID vaccination. Much less do they default to arguing that there are medical contraindications which would prevent them from taking the vaccination. It's all about religion. Very strange situation. So if we think about regulatory solutions in light of national culture, and there have been studies of all of the major countries and where they fall on the spectrum of national cultures, perhaps we will have less hesitancy to what needs to be done during the next pandemic or similar emergency. Now, I very quickly want to, because we don't have very much time left, about three minutes, three speakers. Each of you gets one minute to respond to Alberto's questions. So number one, let's start with you, Ricardo. What do you think? Answer the question. One minute only, I'm serious, like maybe two sentences. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I say thanks to Alberto for the question. It's very interesting. Uh, the balance between um, constitutional rights, it's the key of the discussion about the covenant in vaccination in Italy. And uh, all, the legislator has done a balance between this value by providing that the employer should verify, first of all, the possibility to relocate the employee to other tasks in order to avoid the suspension from work and from pay. Because we have the public health, we have the solidarity, but on the other end, we, are, we have the right to work and the right to obtain a fair remuneration. And so there is the idea that the suspension of the pay is in any case uh, the last uh, resource to be used and to be avoided where possible. I think that in this uh, field, uh, for, we, for the tasks that can be performed also on a remote basis, also according to the principle of good faith and correctness in the performance of the working activity, the employer may evaluate if it's possible to allow the employee to perform the tasks on a remote basis and avoid to, um, to suspend the pay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mer now, now you please, and also similarly brief. Yeah, thank you. I try to be brief. Uh, yes, in Estonia, the employer has um, competence to decide who must be who must vaccinate on the basis of uh, a risk assessment. And uh, really, the employer has no obligation to involve uh, a doctor. Uh, but in practice, it's quite a big problem uh, because we have many court, court cases where court uh, is uh, assessing uh, is this uh, risk assessment is adequate or not? Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, last, Matteo, please, you get the final word. It's three yeah. o'clock, but we let you go over by one minute. Okay, so thank you for the question. And uh, yes, so about the role of social partners, I'm sure that they could do something and more than something. So uh, we saw that social partner in Italy, I'm talking about Italy now because uh, so, each country has its rules. In Italy, they did a lot during the first stage of the pandemic because with these three lateral agreements, they introduced the obligation to use masks, the control of temperatures, so a lot of measures to protect the health and safety of employees. There are some orientations uh, in uh, Italian doctrine that say that also once the uh, legislator has individuated the vaccine as a measure, 
and uh, it did when imposed mandatory vaccination to health professionals. There is some margin according to regulation of Italian occupational health and safety also to adopt uh, vaccines on workplaces in particular maybe not uh, mandatory but as a measure as i think also ricardo was mentioning before as a measure that uh, the employer recommends and maybe also with agreement of trade unions and then people not complying so are suspending because not fit to do the task that they are appointed to but uh, basically i think that more than this one this thing that is quite problematic obviously because you always move on the mar on the border between uh, uh, measures that are justified to cope with the pandemic and discrimination so it is always risky uh, for sure um, trade unions could do for example oh, trade unions and the employers obviously so social partners could do some sensitivizing campaigns to try to convince people that are skeptical because this is the point in italy so also to reply what susan was saying in italy we have not uh, particularly problems concerning religious belief of personal belief of people but we have uh, a lot of people that are skeptical and i think also and I go to the last point. So I finished to reply to um, uh, Alberto before. So I think that one, mainly sensitization. And also we had the social partners that acted also in the opposite way, because in some companies, for example, employer and employees, um, employer and trade unions agreed to pay for the COVID tests to people. So to allow them to get the certificate without this, uh, so this, in, this incentivization that the government was doing, that you have to get vaccinated because if not, you have to pay the test. Some employers said, okay, I pay the test so people can continue working with me, getting the certificate without, uh, so uh, economical burden. To finish, to say something about what Susan said, and I know that I am beyond one minute, but other 30 seconds, not more. So in Italy, I think uh, we don't have this religious issue, but we have uh, from one, one point of view, a lot of people skeptical. But I think also it uh, has a, um, a role in the introduction of this solution, the perception that uh, the government, so the political context and also newspaper head of their people because i work in spain in spain there is an idea by so the media and the government they have a faith on uh, the responsibility that people can get so they have not introduced uh, any kind of uh, pass uh, or similar thing and in any case it is one of the country with the highest rate of uh, people vaccinated in europe so this is totally another another strategy. I haven't introduced it in the paper because there was nothing to compare with Spain because they did nothing. But uh, in that case, we say a totally opposite thing. So the government say, we, be, we trust in you citizens. We know that you are a serious person. You know that you got vaccinated and it worked. Mm -hmm. In other countries, in which there are also political reasons because France and Italy are the countries that had most uh, political issues linked to populism in uh, so we can say Western Europe in the last uh, decade, I would say, there was more, more skeptics, skepticism, I think also by governments and political forces about their citizens. And so said, okay, we have to do something to push people to get vaccinated because I think that these guys, otherwise they don't do nothing and we would have more problems than when they, so the risk that the outbreak restart and the pandemic become worse. And so sorry for taking five minutes instead of one, but I have I hope that I said something that is interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.